right. I'm glad to be here, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was going to sing a special, but the piano's left. <laughs> so I'll just sing a, a verse of it a cappella, okay? I was drifting away on life's pitiless sea, and the angry waves threatened my ruin to be. And away at my side, there I dimly descried a stately old vessel, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy. Well, I'll sing the last one, okay? Or I'll, I'll sing this verse. The good captain commanded a boat to be lowered, and with tender compassion he took me on board. And I'm something. Uh, <laughs> you see, that's what happens when you get to be 84. You forget things. Happy today, all my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior, and now I can say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, from my soul I can say, bless the Lord, oh soul. Sinking down neath sin's merciless wave, the strong arm of our captain is mighty to save. Then trust him today, no longer delay. Board the old ship of Zion and shout on your way. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Sing and shout on your way, Jesus saves, and he surely does. I had, a, I had a mama that taught us to sing. I didn't have any voice lessons. Some people wish I had. Uh, but my mother used to stand us beside the piano and sing. She had a beautiful soprano voice. And uh, when I was in high school, I actually, you know, when they asked you, what do you think you'll do? I said, I'm going to be a singer. Well, I didn't know what I was talking about. But uh, I did become a singer after I got saved. I wanted to sing all the time. I found myself singing all kinds. You know, all these songs you're singing here are songs that you will sing forever. And you just need to keep, on, keep them on your heart, keep them on your lips, keep them uh, on your mind. And uh, when you get out there serving the Lord in various places, teach them to everybody else. Because there's churches out there that don't know how to sing. And uh, people that don't know how to sing. So, uh, I appreciate uh, the pastor uh, allowing me to be here this week. And I had a wonderful time in the class this morning. And the, uh, and the chapel hour. And I'm looking forward to having a wonderful time here tonight. Uh, I was uh, thinking about the fact that, uh, talking about being 84, we've got a man in our church who is 101, and uh, he still drives himself to church. Uh, he's there faithfully, and his name is John Johnson. He was a deacon for many, many years at Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga. And when we get together at some kind of a senior fellowship or something, he'll tell people, now John and I here, we go, we go back a long way. <laughs> but I don't go back as far as he did. Uh, I look up to him. Amen? And he's, but he just loves the Lord. He's there. He's faithful. And uh, I heard I, we had a, had a senior fellowship, and I was ne sitting next to him. It was actually a work time. We were putting stuff together to be distributed. And so... Uh, He's sitting there, and, I, and his phone rang. He carries a cell phone. He knows how to operate it. 
and he answers his cell phone and he's you know older people they talk loud when they can't hear well he he doesn't hear well he says hello what where am i i'm here at the church i'm working how did i get here i drove <laughs> and when i leave here i'm going to a funeral <laughs> but uh he's a joy to be around <laughs> 101 years old, and uh, I asked him, I said, tell me about some of the problems you have. He said, I don't have any problems. <laughs> I don't know whether he's lying to me or not, but anyway, because <laughs> I've sure got some problems. Uh, now, turn to Mark chapter 5, and I want to share with you a <coughs> message entitled, The Missionary of Decapolis. It starts out with a demon possessed man. And when you find your place in chapter 5, verse 1, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, if you stand with me, please. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him. Out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now, the man himself was not worshipping him. It was the demons that were worshipping him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High, God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, that thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is, uh, is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into, uh, into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine, notice, I want you to notice how this reads, and they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and the, in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil clothed in his right mind and they were afraid and they were afraid and they that saw and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine and they began to pray him to depart out of their coast now we'll stop right there father Speak to us through this passage of Scripture. Help us, Lord, to learn some things that we might be much wiser, that we might understand how the devil works and what we must do for Jesus' sake. And Lord, we pray now that you'll have your way in every heart and life. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we find Jesus coming from over the water through the sea. And before he gets there, if we go back in the chapter 4, you find that there was, a, there was a storm. Jesus was sleeping and they thought they were going to be perish and they wake him up. And... Uh, he accused them of having little faith. 
Surprisingly, though, if you go through the Bible, you'll find that most of the people that were used of God had little faith. You think about the man that wanted Jesus to heal his son. And he said, if thou believest, right? Oh, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. You ever cried, cried out to the Lord in that way? Oh, I'll tell you. You need to, we need to. Because we may not be as strong in our belief as we think we are. We need to believe the Lord for some great things. Amen. There was a Jewish evangelist. I mean, I'm not a Jewish evangelist. There was an evangelist who was a Jew, who had, who had been Jewish. He was Southern Baptist many years ago. I remember him coming to Chattanooga and speaking at Tennessee Temple. And he stood in front of the of the chapel and he said I will not be satisfied that I have enough of the Holy Spirit until I can walk into a hospital room and people get saved now he wasn't trying to teach false doctrine he was just simply saying I want more and more and more of the Holy Spirit and the more of the Holy Spirit we get the more the greater our faith is going to be and we need to have great faith. Amen. Great faith doesn't come just like that. Great faith comes from experience we have with the Lord and we find out that he is faithful. Amen. Year by year, God shows himself faithful. Now, the interesting thing about them coming across the sea in that storm, Jesus stilled that storm. It's interesting that the scholars tell us that the same words he used to cast out the demon was the words he used to steal that storm. Can I tell you something? Very likely that storm was created by Satan to try to keep Jesus from getting to this man. And I'm going to tell you something, Satan is going to try to keep us from getting to people who need our help. Right. Satan is going to try to stir up something to try to keep us from getting the attention of people who need to get saved. Right. We need to recognize that. We, not, we need to not, not let that stop us. Amen? There were th three forces at work here in this passage. There was... Satan at work, there was society, and there was the Savior. We see what Satan was doing. Society was trying to bind this man, trying to tie him down, trying to, to uh, help them in ways that only they could help him. And today, society tries to help people in the ways that they can help them, but they're not going to be helped the way they need to be helped until we share the Savior with them. Amen? Amen. The Savior is the answer, Jesus Christ. These devils, even though they had lost their purity, they had not lost their power, they were able to enter into people and to, uh, and to torment them. In the Old Testament, you don't see this so much of this. In the New Testament, you see quite a bit of it. Constantly, the apostles were having to cast out devils. Jesus was casting out devils. Now, these devils, these demons... They could not do everything they wanted to do because they were subject to the power of God. God, in his sovereignty, allows demons to enter into people so that he can show his power by casting them out. 
in these situations. Now, Jesus had authority over these demons. Why did they come and worship him? They had no choice. They had no choice. And then think about the fact that how many demons there were. A legion, thousands, in this one man. And when they could no longer torment him, they wanted to go torment the pigs, the swine. Demons are terrible, terrible agents of wickedness. And we need to not think that we ourselves have power over demons. We don't. Only God has power over demons. We need to pray for people that appear to be demon-possessed. We need to help them come to Jesus. I can think of several times in my ministry where we felt like, my wife and I felt like we were dealing with people who were possessed with them. Both times it was a woman. And one of them was a student at Tennessee Temple. But she got saved. Another one was in a church I had, in, I was started in Selmer, Tennessee, and this was a situation where uh, the woman had put her daughter in our Christian school, and the daughter called us and said, please come and talk to my mother. She was afraid. I'd been, wit I'd been witnessing to her, and she came to the place where she was afraid to go to sleep. She was afraid that the devil would kill her. She had worked in a nightclub, but she had quit, but she was still being tormented. And I mean, my wife and I, we worked with her for hours. I would talk to her, my wife would pray, I would talk to her, uh, I, my wife would talk to her, I would pray, and so forth. And back and forth, we did that for hours, and she would get sick, and she'd run to the bathroom and throw up, and then finally, after hours of praying and talking with her, it's just like all of a sudden it broke. And she just humbled herself before God and just got saved. She ended up becoming a dispatcher for the police department in our city and in our church. And, of course, her daughter was in our school. Folks, we're seeing a lot of things happen in our nation today. And I believe there's a whole lot of it that has, can be attributed to demons. I really do. Well, it's interesting how these demons wanted to be uh, sent away. But no, did you notice how they said, what have you to do, what have we to do with you or you to do with us? What, you know what? In Revelation, it talks about where Satan's seat is. And you know, there are several places in our nation right now, I think, where Satan's seat is. And it's very difficult for Christian people to get an inroad in there because the devil has such a bind on people's minds and hearts. And... I think these demons felt like, hey, Jesus, you're out of your territory. This is our territory. We're here. You say, what makes you believe that? Because when the people who owned the swine or people from the city came out, they did not come out and say, rejoice. Oh, wonderful. This, this man's had the demons cast out. No, they didn't do that. What did they do? They said, go away. Go away. We don't want you here. This is not your territory. The devil had captured that territory. Well, we need to pray. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our churches. We need to pray for, for missionaries. Because it's a battle out there. And we have to win that battle. You know, as we look at this, we see several things take place here. In the 
we get down into verse 17 and 18, we see that after they prayed him that he would depart from the coast, and by the way, did you notice that it says that they, they come to Jesus and they see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. You know that people who are not saved are afraid of people who are saved? I mean, all you're doing is trying to follow the Lord, trying to honor God in your life. But it scares people who are not wanting to do the will of the Lord, who are not following God. You represent an opposing force. Boy, that's why we need to really show our love for these people and let them know that God loves them. You know, there's several things and I shared with your pastor that I didn't, I forgot my notes. I'm preaching without the notes. But uh, as well as I can remember, the next thing I want to tell you is this. <laughs> that there were several things about this man. First of all, he was chained. He was chained by sin and death. The Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sins before we get saved. Amen? This man was dead. He was dead in sin. You, did you notice where he hung out? Places that were desolate, in the tombs, in the caves. You know, I spent 12 years in the Navy, and part of that time I was living in a barracks and watching these other sailors. And boy, so many of them, they couldn't wait to get off on the weekend and take off and just, just uh, do what they thought was fun. But it's always amazing when they came back, they didn't look like they'd had any fun. They looked a mess. Sin will take you to places you don't want to go and keep you there longer than you want to stay. So don't even open the door. Don't even let the devil get, get his foot in the door. Just do what's right. Amen? This man was chained. by death. He was chained by depression. It says he tried to destroy himself. He would cut himself. That almost sounds like some of the cases we're having today. He was depressed. And then our medical field many times, they look at a man who has had depression and they give them drugs that sometimes are suicidal. <laughs> I, had, I got bit by a tick years ago, and I got lines. And the way it affected me, up until that time, I didn't, most of the time I didn't carry notes to the pulpit. But what happened was, I would get up to preach, and it was like it, in about 10 minutes, all of a sudden, my brain was just going neutral. I didn't know it was Lyme's. I knew I had had Lyme's. I did not know that Lyme's was associated with what was happening with me. It took a long time for me to find that out. But while that was going on, I thought at one point that I was going to have to get out of the ministry. Talked to my pastor about it. He said, no, 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 you can't do that. 
and yet I was having such difficulty. I went to a doctor after uh, it had been going on for about a year, and uh, his name was Dr. Uh, down the Bible. Dr. I want to say Dr. Law. <laughs> uh, might have been Dr. Grace. I'm not sure. He came out of Canada. He took, took the place of my, our regular uh, primary doctor. And so I went to see him. And he ran all kinds of tests. He ran tests on my heart. He ran tests on MRIs on my brain and all kinds of stuff. And, and he couldn't find anything. Even when he did the thing on my head, he couldn't find anything. I couldn't figure it out. Anyway, uh, they, the, uh, finally, we went home, and I, said, and I said, Sandy, what was going on back there when all this started? And she got to thinking. She said, you had Lyme's. I wonder if that has something to do with it. She began to look up all the symptoms on the computer and found out that what I was having was some of the symptoms that you have when you have Lyme's. It depends on where it attacks you. You can have Lyme's that, that, that uh, imitates arthritis or imitates heart disease or imitates all kinds of different things. Mine was in the brain. And so we went back to the doctor and explained to him. I'd had Lyme's and could he test me for Lyme's? No, he, you, don't, you don't have Lyme's. I'm not going to test you. My wife would not hear that. She made him finally agree to test me. And when you take the test, if you score 90 or above, you had Lyme's. I didn't have it because I only scored 89. And that's what he told me. You've never had Lyme's. Well, my primary doctor, when I, before him, had said I did have Lyme's. So that's when we began to, to, to doctor the Lyme's. And uh, I still take something today that I started taking back then that that uh, helps me to think better. I, did, I took some just before I came over here, and I'm, I'm really thinking better now. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's supposed to help the neurotransmitters to connect. And uh, so, uh, what I'm saying is this. One of the things that doctor told me was this. He said, you have depression, don't you? I said, no, I've never been depressed. Oh, yes, you are. You, you're suffering from depression. Now, it's strange that they have to convince us we're suffering from something, right? Uh, hey, listen, don't ever buy that stuff. Don't ever go that direction. We are not depressed people. This man was saved. He was in his, uh, in his uh, sane mind, and he was dressed. It's strange how the... Our conduct changes when we get saved. This man was chained by sin. He was chained by, by uh, depression. And he was chained by a number of other things. He's chained by society. But also, he was changed. He was changed in that he was saved. And he was in his, he was in a, his, his, he was in a, Sane mind. And uh, the Bible says that when we get saved, we are of a sound mind. We don't have to be afraid. And uh, God helps us to be able to think clearly. And, uh, you know, he was clothed. It's interesting how when people get saved, their wardrobe changes. Right. Amen? Right. And uh, I'll tell you, when I was, before I was saved, I was, an, I was a gung-ho sailor. I mean, when it came time to go to the base, man, I got all spiffed up. I got my spit shine shoes on. I got my uniform on, make sure everything was just in the right place. I'd go, and I would do my duty there. And then on the weekends, when I would come home and not have to be there at the base, I would just lay around. I wouldn't shave. I didn't shower. I didn't do anything. I didn't go to church. When I got saved, all of a sudden, I wanted to wear the very best clothes I had. 
I wanted to clean up my act. And uh, I wanted to be in church. I wanted to be there for the Sunday morning and the Sunday night and the Wednesday night. And uh, I even, that very first week that we started attending faithfully, I was there for the, for the visitation. Uh, started out 500 Sunday morning, 250 Sunday night, uh, 150 on Wednesday night. Got to the visitation, there was 10. Got to the men's prayer meeting on Saturday night, there was two, the pastor and the song leader. Now, folks, let me tell you something. You say, can you do anything about that? I didn't know whether I could or not, but I tried. I got a, pastor gave me a directory of the, of the church with their pictures on it, and I began to call some of these people. I was, a, the, I was a new convert. I began to call some of them, and I'd call them on Saturday morning. Uh, would, you, uh, would you mind uh, uh, telling me, are you going to be busy tonight? Well, I know. Did you want to come visit? No, but I'd like to invite you to come to the men's prayer meeting. <laughs> These guys were business owners. They were deacons in the church. They were ushers. You know what? After about a month or so, we had 39 men on their face before God because those three men came the first time, five more came the next time, and just kept multiplying, and God did a work and people begin to get up out of their chairs as they're abused and come forward and get saved that have been sitting there lost for years. Now, folks, let me tell you something. God can use us in ways that we don't even imagine we can be used. But we have to show up. We have to be willing to get up there in, up front and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. This man was in his right mind. He was fully clothed. And it says here that not only was he chained and changed, but he was called. It says in verse 18, And when he was come into the ship, he that, had, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. I know how he felt. That's the way I felt. I wanted to be with Jesus. And uh, Jesus said, how, how be it Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them what great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. He was called to go. Go to your friends. He was called to tell. Tell them what's happened to you. He was called to show. Show them the compassion the Lord's had on you. Now, folks... What this is saying is, go give your testimony to people who need to hear you. You have a testimony? You know your testimony can be one of the most powerful things you ever used to win a soul to Christ? Amen. I was in Waldorf, Maryland. I was knocking on doors. Didn't have anybody to go with me, so I was just knocking on doors and giving out literature and inviting people to church. But this one lady answered the door, had these little children hanging off of her legs, and, and she looked so pitiful. And I asked her, uh, tell me, has anyone ever taken a Bible and shown you how you could know for sure your soul was going to heaven? She said, I don't believe so. I said, would you mind if I shared some scriptures with you? Go ahead. And I shared the Roman road with her, and she received Christ standing there at her door. Amen. I said, you have children, you have a husband. When is your husband going to be here? He'll be here tonight. What time could I come? Why don't you come about seven? I went at seven. I, she opened the door. When she opened the door and I was standing there, I heard this voice in the background. Well, hello, preacher. My wife told me you were coming. Come on in here. I've heard it all. 
Tell me what you got. <laughs> now, actually, he had had plans for he and his wife to get involved in a wife and husband swapping a situation just in the near future. But you know what? I went in there and I thought to myself, you know what? Uh, if he's heard everything, what am I going to tell him? And so we sat down on the couch and I started giving him my testimony, how the Lord had saved me. And then I went from there into the scriptures about salvation and concluded by saying, his name was Dean Wheeler, Dean, what do you think about this? He said, I believe, you, I believe you believe all this stuff. I said, Dean, I believe it with all my heart. The question is, are you willing to believe it? He said, what do you want me to do? I thought, well, I hope this is for real. And I went through the plan of salvation again with him, and he prayed to receive Christ. Sunday, they were, all, they were at the church. <clears throat> Now, when, when I was starting churches, I had a habit of doing this. I'd stand at the door. We only had one door out. And they all had to come through that door. I'd stand at the door and I'd say, I'll see you tonight. I'll see you tonight. I'll see you tonight. I knew most of them weren't going to be there that night. But I still told them and reminded them I'd see them tonight. After a few times, Neil says, okay, preacher, I'll come tonight. Sunday night, I'll see you Wednesday night. I'll see you Wednesday night. I'll see you Wednesday night. You know, people are dumb. <laughs> because they're sheep. Right? But after a while, they begin to get the idea, I think the preacher wants us to come on Wednesday night. <laughs> I'll see you tonight. Okay, preacher. It comes on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, I'm there at the door. I'll see you tomorrow night for a visitation. I'll see you tomorrow night for a visitation. Finally, he said, preacher, I'll go with you, but you got to do all the talking. He came. We went out together. I introduced him. I hardly got a word in edgewise. <laughs> Dean Wheeler got in all the way. He was as rough as a corn cob. I mean to tell you, he had to get rid of some stuff in his life. But he ended up working in our bus ministry, and he's still serving the Lord today in a local church. Folks, let me tell you something. Every one that's won is a prize for God. And we need to just keep working with them, keep working with them, keep working with them. God can make of them a jewel. Amen? Notice what this man did. He did go give his testimony. It says here in verse 20, and he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. The reason they marveled was because they knew what he had been before. And all men did marvel. Notice, he published in all of Decapolis. Wonder how big Decapolis was. Do you know what Decapolis was? Decapolis, 10 cities. He didn't just go to one city, he went to 10 cities. And he went all through those cities and he gave his testimony and people got saved evidently. They marveled and they no doubt glorified God as a result of it. People will glorify God through what he has done for us if we will let people know we have a testimony. How many of you have a testimony? Let's see your hands. How many are you going to tell us this week? Let's see your hands. How many are you going to bring somebody to church this next Sunday? Let's see your hands. All of a sudden, there's fewer hands. What happened? When I was starting churches, I used to have a lot of hand raisings. I get people committed. 
Do you know I found out something? I found out that I don't do much unless I commit myself. I find out if I don't overcommit myself, I won't get done what I'm supposed to get done. So I overcommit myself. Somebody said, Brother Bales, shouldn't you be retired? I said, I've already retired. I put brand new tires on my car last year. <laughs> Let me tell you, you don't have to quit until Jesus says quit. Amen? And so we need to keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Let the Lord use us as long as he gives us strength. I'm not saying everybody's able to do what I'm able to do. I'm not able to do what a lot of other people are able to do. But I'm going to do what I can do while I can do it for the one that I need to be doing it for. Amen? Now, the question is, how many people are going to hear from you this week? How many people are going to hear your testimony this week? Your testimony could be bringing people to the Savior this coming week. Let's stand together. If God has spoken to your heart about your need to be a greater witness for Him, here's a man that was demon-possessed. He was trying to destroy himself. He had lost his friends. He had lost his family. He had lost his everything he ever owned. He had lost everything. But Jesus changed all of that. When we see these people out here who are looking just like this man is, we should not see them as being hopeless. We need to see them as being someone that we need to give hope to. Amen? And we can give them the hope of the gospel. Jesus can save to the uttermost and to the guttermost. So if God has spoken to your heart about being a greater witness for him, either come here and kneel or kneel down where you are and ask the Lord to work through you to give you courage to do what you know is right to do. Amen? Our Father in heaven, we pray, Father, that if there is someone here tonight that does not know for sure where their soul will spend eternity, that they would come and speak to one of the pastors here, speak to one of the workers. Let us help them, Lord, to come to the Savior. And then, Father, we pray that all of us would be surrendered all of us would be committed all of us would be totally given to you that you might take us and use us in ways that only you can do help us lord to be all that we can be for you that we might be a glory and a praise to you in jesus name we pray amen <laughs>